All right, today um, we're going to talk about uh, international strategy. And um, I have uh, Preston and Jared. <laughs> and uh, Ben, over. Okay. Get us started. So, um, I want to start and just sort of walk through each of the companies. So, Preston, we'll start with you. Um, we want to just sort of quickly go through what were Philips, what was Philips' strategy, and uh, how did that allow them to become the leader, the worldwide leader in the consumer electronics businesses? Then we'll move to Panasonic and Sony, and what, how was their strategy different from Philips? And, and how did that help them emerge as the leaders in the industry from that 1980 to 2000 time period? And then we'll move to Samsung and talk about uh, Samsung and how their strategy is different. So, Preston, let's start with Philips. What's their strategy? Okay, so their market is electronics. I guess all the companies are electronics. <coughs> international. So consumer electronics, sort of very broadly defined, yes. and uh, very international in terms of geography. Okay. okay. Um, that's their market. The unique value is they're very. They differentiate their products for more specific uh, consumers. So, so they differentiate their products for different regions, for different regions of the world or different countries. Okay. At least that's how they started. Uh huh. And they have kind of a wide um, a range of products as well. They start out in light bulbs. And then I think they move from light bulbs to like electric, electronic vacuum tubes. So they do light bulbs, vacuum tubes are used in TVs, right? Yeah. X ray tubes, electric. They do X ray tubes, they move on to TVs and <coughs> radios and all of that stuff. Okay? Um, resources and capabilities. So one of their capabilities is their research. They developed that early on, and that led to the expansion of their product line. So <clears throat> they're good at R&D. They're doing this. Uh, where are they doing their R&D? Mostly in their corporate um, lab, or yeah, corporate lab. I think that's in Germany. I think it's uh, I I know, in the are they in the Netherlands, I believe. So they've got their corporate lab. Do they also have other R and D labs? I think they have a few other R and D labs in different countries. Yeah. Okay. So they've got the corporate lab, but if uh, if you are running the the German market, let's say, as a national organization manager, do you have some R and D? Yeah. You have R and D in your some product development. Is that Robert? one of the differences between them and Sony? Like Sony was also so. They were both big into research, but one of the differences is that Sony sort of had this centralized development. Even if you could develop your own things, you sort of had to check with it. Sort of Philips didn't have quite that many. Yeah, so let's, in fact, maybe what we do is we think about how they're able to deliver these differentiated products. Part of it is has to do with their, their research. They're, they're good at research. Um, they also have not just their corporate lab, but they have uh, R&D in multiple countries. In fact, I think they said, it said somewhere in the case that uh, certain TV with Teletext was developed in, you know, Great Britain. Austin, yeah, Great Britain, and another something else was developed in Australia, and then other, you know, the other countries could sort of grab those technologies and take them and adapt them into their markets. In fact, what might be helpful here is to see. I know this is a fairly complicated organization, but. Let's see if we can sort of map out their organization structure or design. Because the way you design your organization is going to have a pretty big influence on the, your ability to implement your strategy. So, um, Preston, 
the CEO of Philips is sort of running the whole the whole shop. Who do you think reports into the CEO? I know it's not it's not mapped out in the case, but I'm assuming, I'm assuming like vice presidents or okay. managers of the different products. Okay, so <clears throat> so they have Austin. Did you want to? So they've got managers of products, and then what else? Yeah, Philips has the NOs. They have their national organization. National organizations are the presidents of the national organizations. And they're pretty autonomous. And they're pretty autonomous. And um, what kinds of, uh, uh, if you think about the way this works, it's actually, uh, you're going to have, <coughs> I'm going to draw it out this way. It's a matrix organization where on the one side you've got product divisions. Right, they talked about, I don't know how many product divisions they had, something like 11 or, so they had a number of product divisions. And then they have their NOs that run different sort of country organizations. So you've got someone who is the president of the national organization over the US or North America. You have the same thing for UK, France, Germany, and so on. <clears throat> And if you're the president of the, any of these national organizations, what kinds of functions do you have reporting to you? What do you have control of? Awesome. R&D, sales, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So the functions would be R&D. So they have R. Do they have R&D? Yeah, yeah, they have R&D. Do they have product development? Yes. Okay, manufacturing. Yes. Yeah, sales and distribution. Yes. Service. Okay, so basically, they're running like their own little companies here. Um, although they do have a central, I'm going to put a central R&D lab that generates research that can be pulled by any of the national organizations or sort of the product divisions. But basically, you've got R&D, you've got product development, manufacturing, sales and distribution. And how do you think the CEO measures the performance of the UK national organization manager? What kind of metric do you think they, they, they could use? Profitability. Yeah, profitability. For the, for the most part, they're running their own, sh their own show here. So they're just going to look at the P&L, they're going to look at the growth in sales, and they're going to look at the growth in profits <coughs> and how profitable they are as a country. But then you've got on this side, here you've got product division. So you've got radio and TV and um, you know VCR slash DVD. So now you've got product divisions as well. So um, <coughs> Preston, if you were trying to um, measure the performance of these folks, how do you think you'd do that? the president in the Phillips organization. I would assume still by sales or profitability. Sales would be easier. Sales would be easier. So what are the sales of radios across all these countries? What are the sales across? Do they actually have control over all the costs? No. Not really. Because <clears throat> these are the folks that have control over more of the costs. And when push comes to shove, where do you think the power lies in this country, in this company over this time period? Is it more here? With the national organization presidents, or more here with the business product divisions. NOs. NOs. The NOs. What makes you think it's the NOs? They, they could decide. I don't want to sell radio. I don't think India is going to buy radio, so I'm not going to sell them. Right. They could decide they, which products they want to use. In fact, the North American U.S. They decide not to take the internally developed. VCR technology, the V2000, they decide to license and use VHS in the U.S. market. That'd kind of tick you off, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know? <laughs> if you're like, you've spent all of this money developing this new technology to play movies at home, and the biggest market in the world, the national organization manager says, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. I think we're going to license it from our competitor and, and, and manufacture and sell a VHS video player in the U.S. market. How does that happen? 
<clears throat> so when, this is the question. When you ask how does that happen, what could make this not happen? If there's more communication or if there was less autonomy, I guess. If there was less autonomy. In other words, the CEO would have to say, nope, boys, you're going to sell our internally developed technology, and you're going to go push it. But that's not the way Philips was really set up. It was very decentralized, and the way you maximize the whole was you let each national organization manager decide what worked best in that particular market. Now, I don't know. Would the V2000 have worked in the United States? Hard to know. We don't know. We know they decided to do VHS, and we'll talk more about that in a moment when we get to Panasonic. They decided to license VHS, but at the time there was you know, competing technologies. There was Betamax from Sony, there was the VHS from Panasonic, and then you know, there was the V2000. And we know that VHS beat both Betamax and the V2000, and it became sort of the standard. And it was a winner-take-all kind of market. And we'll talk more about that as well. All right, so. So the power lies, this is, it's important to understand the power lies with the national organization managers, and it's illustrated in the case by the fact that the national organization president here could make that decision for, for you know, this country. <clears throat> and they all have their own R&D product development, manufacturing, scale, and distribution. This research, you know, that they're doing at the corporate level and in the markets helps them to come up with differentiated products you know, the, the big wooden, uh, I don't know if you remember, do you remember the, the TV set that might have been in your great, your grandfather or grandmother's or your great grandmother's home? Does anybody remember? What did that look like? A piece of furniture. It was, it was the entertainment center of yesteryear, right? Today we, we, we stick a TV in a cabinet, right? And we build the entertainment center and we stick the TV in to fit. But in, the, in those days, it was this, and, I don't, how, who grew up outside of the United States here? All right, so how, how big, how big, um, think about uh, the TV set in your great grandparents' home. How, how, how large was it? It was pretty small. And this was in Hong Kong, Peru, and how, how big was yours? About that big? Yeah? Marshall? Oh, I, I. My, my grandparents were in the States. So okay. I was, I was, uh, so you were living. Okay. So, so when people think, talk about a, a TV um, in another country in the 60s and 70s, they think of big TVs like this. It's like, no, you don't get it, right? We're talking this piece of, it usually went from here to here. <laughs> it was a huge piece of furniture. In my home, we had our, our, our stereo in it as well. So it had a TV in it, had a record player. It was a huge piece of furniture. And yet, in Peru, in you know, in Asia, uh, in in the the in Europe, South America, they were not selling those kinds of TVs. They were very different. In fact, if you went up to Scandinavia, they were selling uh, you know TVs that usually had more of the teakwoods. You know that they were garnished with the teakwoods because they that's sort of more Scandinavian design. You know, they had sort of those woods. So it varied from market to market. Um, all right, so. What kind of um, what kind of problems do you think uh, Phillips started to run into as it hit the 70s and 80s, and Panasonic and Sony start to overcome, sort of overtake them as the world leaders? What do you think some of the problems they're experiencing with this? Yeah, Terry. So they were getting this differentiation kind of advantage, but with the new technologies that were coming out, differentiation wasn't necessarily what was wanted. It was, I want this new technology, so I'm going to get it at the lowest cost. And because of how spread out they were, especially with their nose having their completely separate, almost company, they weren't able to take advantage of any kind of cost or economies or cost advantages. So Panasonic and Sony and the others who came in with more of a centralized strategy able to undercut them. Okay. So how many manufacturing plants did, did Panasonic have, or did uh, Philips have? Anybody? Anybody? I know they had manufacturing, like each NO was in charge. Each NO had some of their own manufacturing. I think that, that somewhere in the case, it talks about them closing a hundred out of 
100 out of 356 plants. They closed 100 plants. Okay, that's a lot of plants. Um, especially in Europe, where Europe actually protects their workers compared to the US, at least other <laughs> markets. We, we, we want to let our companies be able to be flexible and responsive. So we, we have much lower cost to layoffs than they do in Europe. They had to close 100 out of 356 plants. So they still have 256 plants even after they finished it. So this is, the, this is where, when you think about manufacturing, and you got 356 plants, and there were probably more than that, because this was now the 90s. So I think at one time they had close to 500 plants. Um, so very decentralized. This allows them to be very responsive to the, a local market and, and produce for the local market, but you can't get economies of scale when you're producing different products for different markets using different components. And so this now starts to become very high cost relative to uh, Panasonic and Sony in the 80s. So let's move now. Jared, since I was going to call on you anyway. Next, why don't we move to, we'll just talk about Panasonic for right now. Tell us about their strategy. All right, so market, similar market okay. as Philips. Okay. Electronics International. Some electronics mm -hmm. International, okay. Their unique value, though, instead of trying to differentiate depending on the country, was bringing these standardized, low-cost electronics worldwide. Okay. So it's really standardized, low-cost products. Mm -hmm. And actually, we should know, they really weren't international until after World War II. Right. right? They're pretty much a Japanese-centric company, it wasn't really until after World War II that they began to expand. Whereas Philips had expanded around the globe well before that time. Okay, so they're trying to win with standard low-cost products. Uh, what about their resources and capabilities? How do they deliver that? I think one of their biggest capabilities was their organization structure, where everything focused on, and the success of the individual managers particularly focused on, you need to cut costs as low as possible, or to lose your job. Okay. So it really is this focused on efficiency, high volume production, and you're saying the structure has something to do with it. Yeah, and their global strategy as well, having everything centralized in Japan, allowed them to benefit from economies of scale, both in manufacturing and R&D, and the bigger cost percentages that would be associated with that Philip. Okay. So let's be clear then about how their organization designer structure is different from Phillips. Mm -hmm. So who reports up to the CEO in the... In so the this is with strict product divisions. Okay. So now we're doing radio, TV, VCR, you know, DVD. Those are all product divisions. And then what do you think the product division general manager, what, what functions would be reporting to that product development? So with the different product divisions, we have things like sales, or marketing, advertising, but R&D and product development was kept at the corporate level. Okay. So there's this corporate R&D that's up here. Some people will say they're doing some, you know, sort of product development, design a little bit here. Yeah, but then it's like in the case where if they wanted to change, they'd have to go petition it with right. the corporate level. Right. So. This is the way you get your corporate R&D to be very applied in the research that they do. So they underfund I even charge interest on these. Them. They underfund these folks, so they don't have their full budget for the year to like pay their salaries. How do they get the rest of their money? They sell it to the product divisions. Yeah, they basically go down here to each of the divisions, and they're like, "Hey guys." Anything we can do to help you this year? <laughs> you got any projects for us that we can work on? Right? And, and, and this keeps the focus of their R&D very applied. This is not AT&T Bell Labs, you know, breakthrough research. Um, even Philips was much more on its own. They weren't going down and saying, hey, you know, what, what, what can we do to help you um, with a specific problem like this year or next year? So they tend to be really good at doing R&D around process innovations and efficiency innovations and the things that help these folks be 
really efficient and low cost. Because as you said, that's sort of how they went in the marketplace. And then um, manufacturing, do they have plants in every country? They're centralized in Japan. Yeah, it's pretty much mostly in Japan. And then um, actually in the 80s, as the yen starts to appreciate relative to the dollar, they move a lot of their production to Malaysia. So they have sort of a second source, but they're mostly producing and manufacturing in Asia and shipping it around the globe. Because fortunately these products, most of them are, are relatively small and you're not any too big of a cost penalty. Yes? So later, I mean, Panasonic is the, the Me Too type producer, right? But Sony innovates all these new things and then Panasonic uh, just kind of copies it. Is that due to this structure? Like that become, like this idea of their R&D only doing applied research and that's actually becoming a rigidity over time? Yeah, they could, I mean, the, the, the issue is uh, what, you know, who's working on sort of breakthrough new technologies? And if you force these folks to get some of their funds from folks who are down more in the trenches trying to sell products this next year, then it's harder for them to be working on stuff that's three, five, seven, ten years out. So it's, it's really more the way they motivate and incentivize their, their R&D folks. So Sony is actually pretty similar in their approach, but they don't have that. So they're actually creating new products in their research and development. And, and by the way, uh, in Japan, uh, the, uh, for, for many years, the word that was often used to describe Matsushita, which was the name of the company up until just a few years ago, they would use the word Manishita to refer to, this was Sony people in particular. Manishita means the, the copier, the imitator. So they're the, like the imitator. And, um, and they, they would sort of be used derisively by Sony folks that we're the in innovators and you're the imitators. Um, and uh, I had uh, actually a Japanese uh, executive MBA student in a work class one time who um, we did this case, we discussed this. He went back, talked to his friend who worked for Matsushita and said, I understand that you guys you know, don't really have sort of an R&D lab that creates breakthrough innovations and all that, that you're more into imitators. And he said, oh, no, that's not really true. He says, we have a very explicit strategy about that. We have this innovation lab, and here's where he described where it was. And he said, oh, I didn't know you had a, an R&D lab out there in that part of Japan. And he said, oh, yeah, it's called Sony. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was something very explicit around, you know, we're, we, we are a fast follower. We're going to spend a lot less. In fact, how much less did... Uh, did uh, Panasonic spend then. No, Sony's spending two to three times more. Yeah, so Sony's spending two to three times more on R&D. And, and you sort of see that in Sony products versus Panasonic products, right? Growing up, which are the more expensive? <laughs> Sony's are, you know, they tend to be a little bit more expensive. You know, who's more likely to come out with the next new thing? Sony, right? So whether it's Walkman, DVDs, Blu-ray players, TVs with L. CD screens, whatever, Sony really becomes the leader technologically. So they're using a very, a very similar structure, but instead of focusing on being lower cost than me too, they put a lot of money into the R&D function and they try and create brand new products. And so instead of selling low cost products, we'll just compare Sony here. They're actually trying to sell differentiated products. And they're trying to win by being the first to market with differentiated products. And in fact, that's what they do with beta. So here's my, here's my next question. This VCR battle between Sony and Panasonic and Philips becomes critical to who leads the industry in the 80s and 90s. Sony is first to market with beta, which by all accounts, according to engineers, is a superior technology. A little better quality, and also it's a smaller device. And anybody who's been in a Japanese home knows they like smaller versus bigger. So how is it that Sony loses this battle 
when they are first to market with superior technology. Wasn't well, because Panasonic licensed out their technology for VHS to okay. for companies that they will spread faster? So they licensed it out to their competitors. Yeah. And then why do you think the average person, me and you, why do we pick the VHS player over the beta if, if beta's better? I think it's just availability, I think, because it's licensed out. It penetrated a lot faster and got out a lot faster versus just one centralized company mm -hmm. released it. Like okay. Did. All right, so um, anybody else want to comment on that? I yeah. was just saying it's like the network effect. That's what was there, so that's what we use. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a, a network effect here that's going on. Now, you know, you sort of grew up in, the, you know, you've been in, uh, you know, most of us nowadays don't go to the video stores very often. Right. Blockbusters have pretty much died, but but when you you, you know, used to go to the video store, you could choose between you know DVD and Blu-ray. And actually, for a long time, VHS and DVD and then Blu-ray. You'd have multiple options. At the beginning, you're trying to get you're going to the store and you're looking for beta versus VHS. So one thing that helps is the VHS tends to be a little bit more available than most tapes relative to beta. But but think about. Um, think about what happens when the average person finally walks into the consumer electronics store to buy uh, a, a, a video player. They look on the shelf, and what do they see? They see a Sony Betamax, which looks different and smaller, and it's more expensive, right? So it's more expensive. We'll get to that in a moment. And then next to it, you see uh, Panasonic had three main brands: Panasonic. Uh, JVC was a subsidiary of theirs, and National was another brand of theirs. So you see those, typically those three products. And then you're going to see uh, Toshiba, that's a VHS player, right? You're going to see a Philips, that's a VHS player. You're going to see, uh, actually at that time, a General Electric, which is a VHS player. All of the others that are there are going to be VHS, and then there's one beta. So it, it's sort of like that um, Sesame Street show you've seen. One of these doesn't look like the other. You know, which one is different? You walk in, and it's like there are nine players that are the same, and then there's one that's different, and it's more expensive. And so the average person goes for the cheaper, less expensive alternative, where there are a lot more that are out there. So, Chuck? Yeah, it just reminded me, back when I was in high school, I used to work for Circuit City. I used to be in like, their TVs around town. Department. Um, and I remember the same thing happened with Blu ray and HD uh, movies. And it was the same type of idea where you go through actually HD and Blu ray at the time, basically the same quality. Um, but what the real leverage point was for Blu rays when it landed to deal with Disney, I mean, they had movies that people were wanting to see. And when you looked at the shelf, you have HD movies, which might have been like, you know, four to 12 action movies. And then there was like 30 Blu ray movies. And like during the very beginning, I people like, well, it looks like that one's going to become the leader because people were hesitant to invest in, in an HD player, you know, with an HD movie. Like, well, just the sheer volume and yeah. the shelf is what really deterred people going to the red. Yeah, so, uh, so I think there are actually two different issues going on here. Number one is when they license the technology to all these other players, they all ramp up production, right? Are these players different in terms of their design? VHS players, we've licensed, here's the way you make it, right? And in fact, the other smart thing they did was they, they licensed it, but JVC made the most expensive component, which was the component that would actually read the tape. And you had to buy that from JVC. There were no other outside suppliers. So everybody, so they get not only the license fee for everyone produced, but they are selling the most expensive component to the VCR to everybody. But then you get economies of scale in production. Now you've got nine companies ramping up production. And then all of a sudden, the cost of the components comes down because they're using all pretty much the same components. So you think about experience curve effects. Um, all of a sudden, it's 20% cheaper because you're easily, it's, this is probably a kind of a product that's on a 75, 80, 85% experience curve slope. And so very quickly, it's cheaper. And then there's more of the availability of the titles. And in fact, Sony loses the, the, the standards battle. We now think of this as a standards battle because everybody really does want the same standard. It's the network effect that Christopher's talking about kicking in. We'd like to be able to use, buy a DVD and be able to use it multiple locations or a, VA, a, a player, a, a tape, and not have to go different places and it won't work. So this, the standards kicks in. Sony's so hurt by the loss 
of the standards battle for beta that they run out and they buy Columbia Pictures. This is a movie and, and, and music entertainment company. So why, why would they do that? Were they just, they needed some entertainment after this disappointment? <laughs> Loss? What do you think's going on, Jerry? To, as the picture maker determines, here's what we're going to put our films on. So if we can't get anybody to buy your players, let's start making great movies that only are on the disco. Yeah, so this is getting back to Sean's point, that that if 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 Sony, and this, this then helped them later in the Blu-ray battle, so Sony Pictures now owns lots of rights to TVs, right, and um, and C, you know sort of musical artists, CDs, things like that. So that means they can say, you know what, you're going to never watch those movies on HD, <laughs> never. They will they will never be available, right? Or you do a deal with Disney, only on, you know we'll we'll do only only on our player will it work, and that's what helped them win in the next standards battle, which was HD versus 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 Blu-ray. Um, Matsushita, Panasonic, ever the imitator, runs out and buys MCA Universal. Because they don't want to be left behind. <laughs> um, and it takes about four years, and um, MCA Universal tanks. And they sell it, and they, they lose about half a billion dollars. Um, and one of the the, one of the questions that people ask is why is Sony, Sony has been reasonably successful with Columbia Pictures, Sony, it's now Sony Pictures, was reasonably successful whereas Matsushita was not. Any, any guesses as to why Sony was more successful with that type of an acquisition than Panasonic? Well, I mean, Sony's are the innovators that wasn't looking to do new things, so I mean, if Panasonic had a, if they apply the same strategy they had with the manufacturing and there's product design, if it's any movies, I mean, hey, it looks just like a spin-off of the other movie that just came out, you know, yeah. you're gonna... It's hard to succeed just reverse engineering other movies, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and then putting them back out there. So you actually have to know something about innovation, right? <laughs> and this is where they're focused, they're good at efficiency, right? High volume production, um, not innovation, not doing new things, whereas Sony, on the other hand, is they're really actually pretty good at innovation. And if you think about an entertainment company, you've got to be pretty good on innovation, creativity, right? That's sort of, you know, movies, music, all of that. And so many people said they just did not understand how to run a company that, had this, that, that needed to be really good at creativity and innovation to succeed. All right. Um, so, Panasonic, Sony, they start to run into some problems as well when they hit around 2000 because Samsung comes along. All right, so now let's go to Ben. So, Ben, what, what, what do you think are some of the problems that they are running into relative to Samsung? Why is Samsung able to overtake them? Uh, we'll talk a lot about how Samsung, so their, one of their capabilities was manufacturing very cheaply. So I kind of I kind of feel like there are two different stages in Samsung's life. There's okay. the first, the first <laughs> stage before the financial crisis, when they kind of got in the market by excelling in manufacturing and they sold no-name products to other brands that would then use them. And then after the financial crisis, they kind of moved into their own premium product. Yeah, it's what's interesting then is if you think about once again, you know, markets of consumer electronics. Um, and that they're actually, by today, they're broader than Sony and Panasonic in terms of the, the, the set of products that they they offer, right? They're, 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 they're big in semiconductors and chips and components and lithium batteries and all of the component side, but they're also in a, in a very broad array of products, not only sort of TVs, DVDs, and all that, but of course tablets and phones. And so, um, so those are their markets. And when you think about their unique value, you're saying early stage was really around cost, yeah, cost, right? So they're really sort of, they're trying to win because they're low cost and very efficient producers. And Korea is an emerging country at the time and has pretty low wages. But then they start to change this. 
So, so part of what helped them change it, they were the first into the digital technology market when <coughs> Panasonic and Sony were kind of stuck on analog. Mm -hmm. And around the time of the crisis, they were like, hey, we want to we become better. We need to be the first mover into the digital market. Okay. So, so digital becomes an opportunity to become more of a leader in terms of technology, right? So now, now they want to be more of a leader in technology which means they're, they're moving a little bit more to a differentiation strategy, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so then at that point, they kind of start mimicking what Philips did, and then they differentiate their product based on market. Okay, so then they become a little bit more like Philips, differentiating a little bit more by market. All right, so let's see if we can figure out Samsung's organization structure. How, how, how do you think, how does theirs work? Well, conveniently, there's a graph of it at the very okay. end. So at the end, so we have some idea. So they're, they're around, it's product divisions. It doesn't give you a lot of information in that graphic, but they've got, they're sort of, what are the three different? So it's got consumer electronics, which then is into the different kind of divisions of that. Then IT and mobile communications. And then they have device solutions. Okay, so. These are devices? Um, it says device solutions like the memory business and the LED business. Yeah, device yeah. solutions. So we've got things like memory and uh, chips. <coughs> Where's the LCD screens? S S S I, I don't know. Okay. So these are more the components that go into, and they're selling them to competitors, right? They'd be selling them to, to Sony, the LCD screens, of some of the, the, the inputs that other companies might use. So this is, they vertically integrated, this is their devices. And then what do we have in consumer electronics and now the IT communications? Um, so consumer electronics, they, instead of dividing it by, like how I talked about earlier, radio and DVD, they have a more broadly, so visual display business than digital appliance business and printing solution business. So visual display? So kind of like the different parts of they're in pro. And what was the what? Digital appliance. Digital appliance. Okay. And what do we have under information technology? Um, stuff like mobile communications, network, digital imaging, imaging, media solutions. Okay. So this is kind of confusing. Okay. In some ways. Uh, in, in terms of it's like who's you know you want to make sure you're you know, who's responsible for what. But mobile communications seems clear to me, right? All of their phones is going to be in mobile communications. And they'll probably have some devices there. Um, where do they do their product design? At what level? Is it all done in Korea? At, you know, their headquarters in Suwon? Or do they do it more down like Philips does in each country? So, prime, so I think primarily it's done in Korea, but then after the new management initiative, they kind of start moving out to different countries as well. Okay. So how many different, yeah, Andrew? I think they open up like seven different location design places around the world in major cities to be able to attract new ideas. Okay. So we now have these design centers. Um, let's think about, look at where they've located them. Where are the, where are the locations of the design centers? Anybody have that handy? Adam? Japan. Okay, Frankfurt. so Japan. Where? Frankfurt. Frankfurt. Okay. New Delhi. New Delhi. Okay. The United States. Okay. Where else? London. Okay. Shanghai. Shanghai. Okay. And the U.S. was L.A. or they have two in the U.S. Oh, LA, and then they have Milan, right? <laughs> right. Okay, so Shanghai, Japan, Delhi, Milan, Frankfurt, London, US, LA, and then of course they'll have they have something in Korea as well. So if you think about um, let's just sort of think about some of these different uh, design centers. Yeah, go ahead. Don't you also have like 25% of their 
sorry to change the subject, but like 25% is an R&D? 24% of the entire company, right. of their personnel, yeah. are an R&D. Yeah. Yeah. So they've made now, when we think about unique value, and you think about resources and capabilities, early on it was in, as Ben said, manufacturing, right? It was really in being low-cost manufacturing. And they were really good at low-cost manufacturing. But now they've really tried to kick it up in terms of research and development and technology so that they can support this, this change in strategy to now be a differentiator. Whereas in the early days they were, they were really competing like Panasonic very much as a cost, cost leader. <clears throat> so, um, so what's the point of having these design centers in these different places? What do you think, how do you think they, they think about design? What is their... So in a book that this one guy wrote called The Innovator's DNA, talks about how living in other countries actually increases your ability to be innovative and just because it's different cultures, different... So some of it could be that they're trying to foster more innovation from different markets. Um, yeah, that's pretty close. It's but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Curtis. I think those are strategically located. Um, it talks a little bit about... What does it mean to be... St yeah, strategic. Tell us about strategic right. location. So, uh, you know, your, your market for smartphones in the U.S. is going to be completely different than in Africa. So who's designing smartphones for the U.S., do you think? That's probably the L.A. IDEO. Okay, so you've probably got... If we think about high-end, I'll just sort of circle... High-end's probably done here. And probably Japan, right? Japan, they're probably doing high-end stuff, and maybe even Milan and London, right? You might think, all right, so they're probably doing higher-end stuff here. What about, and probably maybe Frankfurt, okay? And then what about Korea, Shanghai, Delhi? So they're looking at more of those markets like India, China, Africa that are looking for more of the low end, cheap entry level yeah. devices. Yeah, so now these folks really understand emerging markets, right? And, and so if you're designing, whether it's TVs, whether it's phones, whether it's VCRs, the kinds of products that will work in India are likely to be different than in the US. And, um, and yet there probably will be some that, they, that work for the U.S. that will work at the very high end in India or China, the very high end. But they want to have a different approach, which is we want to design products that are going to work in each different market. And that means a family of products that go from sort of low end to high end. Yeah, Phil. So the chapter talks about how it's international <coughs> barriers went down as far as trade uh, markets went from national to regional or global. So like Samsung just kind of went with that and became regional in each one of these distributor uh, R&D facilities and production facilities and services like a different part region of the world where they can't have high-end smartphones or they can't have uh, or they can't have high-end smartphones. You know, it depends on where they're at and it's enabled them to kind of have like multiple <coughs> small companies sort of in the sense that this part of Samsung produces these phones for this area. You know, it's really allowed them to so a lot in every area. So compared to um, Philips, are they more or less decentralized? I think that they're <laughs> less decentralized. Okay, so they're more centralized than Philips. Yes. And compared to Panasonic and Sony? They're more decentralized than Sony and, and Panasonic. So they're sort of in between in some ways in terms of the, the extent to which they're centralized versus decentralized. And if we think about uh, how they compete with Apple and smartphones, how is their strategy in smartphones different than Apple's? What is Apple struggling with? Yeah, Josh. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I know that Apple doesn't own like the production and raw materials and all that, and that's totally different with uh, um, 
Okay. So what one difference is these guys do a lot of their own inputs components. And Apple doesn't. And they may be able to be first with certain things now on devices because they do their own components and inputs. John? <coughs> well, Apple doesn't really make a low-end smartphone, whereas... Apple doesn't make this, yeah, they don't they make, make a low-end low low cell phone, whereas Samsung does, and they can use those profits to help fund R&D for their high-end cell phones. So Apple can't do it. Yeah. So this is, this is an issue for Apple now. It's, it, it, they were fine as long as Samsung couldn't imitate them with a phone that was viewed as being a substitute at the high end. As long as they dominate the high end and they're a differentiator, we're in pretty good shape. But all of a sudden, they have this family of products from low end to high end that works especially well in <coughs> India, China, Korea, Brazil, markets where they, people are more price sensitive. And so they're now using that to get people on using Samsung phones and Android when they're less expensive. And then when they upgrade, they're more likely to go to a Samsung phone than they are to an Apple phone. And this is where Apple finally, they, they actually went sort of down market a little bit. Did you notice that? Right. The last? <laughs> so, and yet they're worried about cannibalization of their higher end phone. So they don't want everybody to switch because that means they just make less money per phone. So Apple now has to sort of think about how do we compete against a competitor that if, they can, if we can't differentiate in the high end relative to their phone and they can provide all of low end stuff, they're going to have economies of scale in production and they share co shared costs. They're going to likely be more profitable than we're going to be. Bill? So one thing that influences this is in Brazil, for example, I've been there a lot. And we see iPhones for sale for over you know, 1,500 guys, which is 800 American dollars. So they're really expensive over there. And, and that's because of tariffs. They, they just put a ton of tariffs on American goods. So for Samsung to be able to produce a low-end phone and send it in and kind of have it, it, it does completely undercut Apple in Brazil. And so it's really a really big problem over there. They have to find a different way to do it, or else yeah. they're just never going to have iPhones over there. Yeah, and they do have some decentralized manufacturing around the globe too, right? So they'll have manufacturing, manufacturing plants in Brazil. Um, they, but they, for, for most of South America, they produce in Brazil. Then for the U.S., where do they produce? Where's the manufacturing plants? Mostly Mexico. They have one big plant in Texas, Austin. <coughs> and then in Asia, where do they produce? Korea, of course. China. China is really big, right? China is now uh, they've got like 12, 13 plants in China. But their next growth area, they also have them in Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Vietnam. They just announced, I think, a $4 billion investment in Vietnam because wages are a third less in Vietnam than in China. And they say by 2015, 40% of their smartphones will be produced in Vietnam um, with cheaper labor. So we get this sort of interesting mix. And, and uh, this is really what I want to help you to appreciate. When you expand, a, you know, expand internationally, you have to make certain choices about to what extent are we going to decentralize and localize what we do versus have it be centralized, um, which is more efficient? And, and that's really one of the challenges that companies face. So if we think about Sony overtaking Philips, Panasonic, or Samsung overtaking Philips, Panasonic, and uh, Sony. On the one hand, we have this strategy that's introduced by, which company introduces a multi-domestic? Uh, that's Philips, right? So they come in, they come in with a strategy which is really one of adaptation. Sometimes it's called multi-domestic strategy. And that you want to try and have the product or service more customized in each market. And to do that, you've got to be having a centralized organization structure that allows them the autonomy to design and produce products that work in that particular market. <clears throat> now this works really well back when TVs in the US are like this, and TVs in Peru, what did most of the TVs look like in like your grandparents' homes? You remember? They used to, they were like this small. And what kind of casing did they have? Wood or gray plastic or, what's that? Wood. So maybe a real wood or a fake wood? 
who knows? <laughs> great. And do you remember, Andrew, what? This great plastic. Great plastic. Yeah, mostly great plastic over in Asia. Um, if you went to Korea um, and India, a lot of times the TVs, they had specific things built that had shutters for the TVs to keep the dust off them. Um, because they lived in them, it's a lot of dust. And so they actually would have these cases where they put them in with shutters. So TVs are very, very different. All right, if you walk into a consumer electronics store today, it doesn't matter whether it's the US, could be China, could be Vienna, could be Sao Paulo. What color is a TV? Pretty much black. Right? So this is sort of like Henry Ford all over again. You can have any <laughs> color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> so what, what, what's happened? Do we just not want any other colors, designs? So what do you think? Yeah, hey, Curtis. You might have gotten back to like the essential use of the TV. Right? We just want something to watch a movie or a TV on. Right? We don't want it to be this piece of furniture that's taking up a lot of space. Um, we want to be able to just have it. I want to put it against the wall. I want to be able to hide it if I want it. So that's, you know, they've identified the purpose of the TV and gone more toward just providing the customer exactly what they want, which is lots of viewing space and have it. <coughs> okay. And think about it. Oh, go ahead. Pardon. So I was just going to say, so we have like the idea is the thinner the TV the better, right? The thinner the better. A lot of people have it on the wall, <coughs> whether it's 50 inches or 70 inches, whatever it is. The idea is to have it like blend in, right? So I guess if you had enough money, if people had the means, you'd want like a TV that matched whatever color your wall, is, right? You have a white wall, the white. Well, okay, maybe it could, you could ch it could change. It could change, yeah. right? Yeah. But that's not really cost efficient for the manufacturer. Right. Right. Actually, if you want really high-end TVs that are different colors, go to Bang & Olufsen. Have any, have any of you been to Bang & Olufsen store? It's the high-end Danish. Uh, so they actually, I remember seeing them. They had red color TVs. They had different uh, designs. But the issue is, once Panasonic and Sony started to come in with, we're going to produce the same thing and just sell it all around the globe. And you know what? You're going to buy it. And the reason you're going to buy it is because it's so cheap and it's so reliable that you're going to buy it compared to whatever your thing that was sort of locally tailored. This is, we're going to have different sizes, but you'll buy this because it's so much less expensive and so much more reliable. And with the trade barriers coming down and that, all of a sudden we see this movement towards more standardized products around the globe. And for a period of time, uh, Panasonic and Sony succeed very effectively against the multi-domestic strategy, which is very decentralized, by using more of a global strategy approach or an aggregation approach. So this works really well when differences between countries are large, when, they, when consumers want different things, market to market. But it doesn't work so well when people are willing to take the same product across markets. Sources of advantage here are differentiation and local responsiveness. You also mi minimize political and exchange rate risks when you're local. Uh, and you avoid tariffs, for example. Flip side of that is more of a global strategy, what we call global, where you're winning mostly because of cost, sort of aggregating in one place all of your production. So this is where the product standardized worldwide. You have a more centralized organization structure. National subsidiaries now possess little decision-making authority. Their job is to sell product, push product to the market. And you get the sense that that's what Panasonic's doing, right? They set up foreign sales offices, but then they send their people to Japan from Japan to run it, right? And to coordinate back with Japan. They're not really looking for a lot of innovation to come from those foreign subsidiaries. So it's very much your job is to sell the products that we develop. And um, this works well when differences between countries are small, right? When people, when people across markets will buy the same thing, and the sources of advantage are cost and the ability to coordinate and it also can help in speed in new product development launches worldwide. Because you think about the Philips organization. When they were developing the V2000, they were slow to roll it out. Why do you think they were slow to roll it out? You had to convince each NO individually that it was worth it. You know, it could take months for each NO. Yeah. You don't have that many resources. Yeah, instead of just saying, like Panasonic does, 
VHS, this is our product, everybody sells it. We're going to start manufacturing, you know, we're going to be selling these next week. Instead, it is, you've got to go from country to country <coughs> and convince them that this technology and this product is going to work in their market. So this slows them down big time, right? So this often is, can be more efficient with worldwide product launches. So I want to give you a framework for thinking about international strategy. On the one hand, there are pressures for local differentiation. In other words, to really understand the local country market. This is differences in customer needs. The more different they are, the more pressures there are for local differentiation. Differences in government regulations country to country. Differences in marketing and distribution channels, for example. That's going to push you to be more local in your approach and be more decentralized with your structure. On the other hand, you have these pressures for global integration, this aggregation, when you've got significant economies of scale, when R&D is a big percentage of your cost structure, because you want to spread that R&D across the world, right? Not just across one country. Um, you want to spread the manufacturing overheads, not just across your country, but across the world. So whenever you have a steep experience curve, significant economies of scale, or you need to control the quality of experience, then that's going to push you to be more globally integrated and centralized in your approach. So you have these competing tensions. What we tend to see is that in cases, in industries generally, where these forces are stronger than these forces, we tend to see firms pursuing a multi-domestic strategy. And uh, this tends to work well. And for Philips, it worked very well for many, many years when consumer electronics products tended to be more different country to country. Then we get the standardization, and then all of a sudden the global strategy, which is pursued by Panasonic and Sony, starts to work better. So let's think about how, is a, what, how does a multi-domestic strategy tend to work for films. Well, you got headquarters, which is sort of in some ways like a holding company, or you've got your central lab. And all of these different units around the world, different countries, are drawing upon the resources of the headquarters. Technology resources, some financial resources, but they're basically competing largely in their local market. So the strategy is, hey, we're going to differentiate in local markets. Let's make it work. And our policies are that support that are, let's tailor products to national idiosyncrasies. We're going to sacrifice some efficiency for market focus. We think that's more important. We're going to reach upstream in the value chain with sort of components and technologies for economies of scale. But downstream, we're really differentiating. We're trying to maximize local value out of it, what happens in the local market, country, region. If you think about what Philips' um, organization looked like and the value chain it looked like, back in like the 50s and 60s, it looked like this. Country A had all of its own activities. Country B all of its own. See, for, for the big countries. Smaller countries tended to get folded in with some bigger countries. But can you see the redundancies? You can see why it's so hard for them to be able to compete in terms of cost, because you've got all of these multiple manufacturing locations, multiple R&D locations, and so on. It's very hard to be efficient. And here are some companies that have tended to emphasize this approach. Um, Certainly, Philips did. It's become more centralized. Unilever also is a consumer products company. And Procter & Gamble has moved to, towards more of a multi-domestic strategy. Um, and part of the reason is, when you're doing like foods, food products, those, those tastes tend to be different. You know, no pun intended, from one country <laughs> to another, right? You eat different things in different markets. So if it's consumer products and foods, they tend to be more local. What about um, accounting? Can you send your US accountant over to do accounting in Japan? It doesn't really work that well. You can still be a global organization and serve different clients, but you actually have to do accounting differently in different parts of the world. right? So sometimes you really have to be more decentralized in your approach. And what we tend to see is it tends to be uh, you know, really companies more in consumer products and things where customer tastes tend to be different from market to market. Or government regulations or, or accounting standards are different market to market. Now let's think about the global strategy. It's a little more complex in some ways. Your goal is to gain market share. You try to be a cost leader usually. And here you're going to build <coughs> products to build 
sort of global volumes, and you're going to break down the value chain, and you might exploit low-cost locations around the world. So you might produce all of the VCRs in the world of a certain type in Malaysia, a certain place in Malaysia, and you just ship it around the globe. And you don't produce in each, in each country. Yes? Is, are there very many companies that emphasize arbitrage but are multi-domestic? So they are there, heavily located, but they send maybe the specs, the designs, here's what we need to a central location to be produced at low cost. Yeah, I think what we're seeing the last 10 to 20 years, we, we, we were seeing waves of, we, companies tended to use a multi-domestic strategy up through sort of the 70s and 80s. Then we saw companies come in with a global strategies like Panasonic and Sony, and they started to beat a lot of these companies with multi-domestic strategies. Now we're seeing the Samsungs of the world. And if we look at what Whirlpool was trying to do in appliances as well, now what we're seeing is that they're taking a hybrid approach in some ways in between. They're not as decentralized as Philips, but they're not as centralized as Sony, as uh, Panasonic and Sony. And um, if we think about uh, you know, the extreme global value chain, you could do everything in one country, like Panasonic did for a long time, and then just you know, design, develop, design, ship products around the globe. And all you do is sell in other markets. Or you could actually break it and put different activities in different countries. All of your R&D is in one country, all of your manufacturing is in another country. And, and then you, you, you basically let those be the, the world, your world leader for that particular activity. And, and that's really more the global strategy approach. And some companies emphasizing this, so certainly Panasonic, Coke, HP, Boeing. I mean, Boeing doesn't tailor their planes market to market. You know, they sort of make an airplane and you, you know, you've got to figure out uh, how to fly it. Um, Intel with their chips, they don't tailor chips market to market. Um, so companies that do pretty standardized products and do the same thing over and over tend to use more of a global strategy. But what we see here, then, is late in the case, this is actually Konosuke Matsushita, KM. Um, he uh, ran uh, Panasonic Matsushita for a long time. They're trying to move this way, right, from being centralized to being a little bit more decentralized. And this is uh, one of the CEOs, Timur, at uh, uh, Philips. They're trying to move this way. And where Samsung's come in is they've actually been able to come in and pretty successfully do a little bit of both. So <clears throat> let, me, um, let me just ask you, if we now think about Whirlpool, and there was that short article about Whirlpool. They go and they acquire Philips operations in, in Europe. And what do they do? What strategy do they create in, 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 in Europe? Is it more like Philips? Is it more like Panasonic? Is it more like Samsung? Yeah, so they try and do a little bit of both. They, they definitely try to centralize what Panasonic has been doing. And let's just think about how this works with a product like a, a refrigerator. Okay, so um, how many doors does a refrigerator have and about what size is it? Standard approach. Two, two doors. More and more, we're getting three doors here. In Europe, those of you who've lived in Europe, well, how many doors are in our refrigerator? One. one. Usually it's one, sometimes two. But they're more one to two, we're more two. We've been a standard two-door country for a long time. We're now getting some three-door three refrigerators. Um, let me ask you, has anybody here seen a four-door fridge? You okay. shipped it over. You shipped it over from? Asia. From Asia. Okay. Five-door fridge? Everybody seen five doors? Six doors? Okay, I'm going to show you a six door refrigerator. Because I know you're dying to see it. Um, so, this is a six door refrigerator. And of course, it comes out of Japan. One, two, three, four, five, six. Why in the heck do you need six doors on a fridge? Robert. The only reason I can imagine is different temperatures. You could okay. store different things. You can now store every kinds of, you know, whether it's vegetables, whether it's sake, whatever, at the perfect temperature <laughs> to keep it to maximize its life. Okay. Any other reasons you could think of? You need six doors. 
Yes. Um, lower utility bills. Okay, lower utility bills. See, most of you don't even think about it because you haven't lived in Asia where it's costly, where it's expensive in Japan. Energy is expensive in Japan. In the U.S., we look at that energy rating that comes when we buy it. Yes, you want to say something? We say kimchi. Yeah. Yeah. Kimchi? Yeah, you need a kimchi. You need a kimchi Small. compartment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> actually, um, Samsung, LG, they actually make uh, refrigerators in Korea that have a kimchi compartment. Now, a kimchi compartment is designed to seal in the smell of the kimchi so that it doesn't invade the rest of your food, right? But it has to be different in that market. The, the, one of the issues here is we look at the energy rating here and we're just like, who cares, you know? We don't, we don't really think about energy costs. I mean, we open that refrigerator in the U.S., the big door, you know, in the summer, if we're kind of hot, we'll, you know, we'll cool off a little bit. <laughs> in the fridge. We don't, you know, we don't think about it. This way, you open the door, you get what you need, you close it. It doesn't open up and let all of the cold air out. This is much more efficient. And by the way, the Japanese housewife is known as the most demanding consumer uh, uh, customer in the world because they tend to be highly educated. They tend to be stay-at-home moms. They have dense social networks. In other words, they sound like Mormon. <laughs> but um, so they're always looking for the best way to do things, and so you know you you, you know they, innovation really matters in Japan in these areas. Now let me just take one more minute and show you how this plays out in terms of our framework. So we've got the global strategy, the multi-domestic strategy. What we're calling up here is often called a transnational strategy, which is sort of a hybrid of the two. You're trying to be you're trying to be somewhat locally di differentiated, but also somewhat globally integrated. So how does this work? Well, let's think about <laughs> when, when you look at Philips organization, they did most of these things on a national basis at a country level. Regional would be like multiple countries, right? And global would be for the world. Um, when we think about Panasonic early on, they did pretty much everything in Japan globally. So Whirlpool, Samsung. Where do they do R&D? National, regional, global. It's mostly global, but some regional. What about product design? Now it's mostly regional. Those regional seven centers, those seven regional centers, mostly regional, a little bit global. What about components? Yeah, that's going to be actually very global, and you design around the components that they're building. What about assembly? Well, for, for Samsung, it's mostly regional and a little bit global. But for Whirlpool, there's some that's local because refrigerators and some of these other products that are bulky to ship are very costly. So, um, so some of it for Whirlpool, at least, is more local. What about marketing? See, this is where you actually will often get all three, right? But for the, these folks, it's mostly, they tend to have more uh, regional. We're going to have a, a marketing approach for Asia. A marketing approach for North America, Europe, South America. It's mostly regional in that sense, um, but they also have a little bit that's maybe global and local. Sales and distribution. So it's more it's regional and local, and then service. Yeah, that's really mostly national. This is the way you try to be both global and local at the same time. The trade-off is it depends each function. Some functions are more global. Some functions are more local. So if you're like Whirlpool and Samsung, you design products in different markets using sort of some of the same components, but you can now design for low cost if you want to, or it's something that fits that local market. And, and that's something that you can't do as well if you're going to have a purely global strategy. All right. Thanks. We'll see you in the next part.